Good morning, church. Okay. I will be reading today Genesis 1, 26 to 31, and Genesis 2, 15 to 25 of the English Standard Version. Genesis 1, 26 to 31. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. I have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Now Genesis 2, 15 to 25. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground... The Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, church. It's a great privilege to be with you this morning. Um, as you know, we are preaching about a series, read, uh, Real Talk, uh, meaning we're not talking about light-hearted topics that are nice and fluffy and friendly. They're real, all right? When you ladies were away, we talked about marriage. And Le Sejo had that specific bend towards us as men as well, which was real. It was good. And so are we talking about all aspects of Christian life and how it relates to what we are doing this side of eternity. And today we are talking about work. So sorry, your work week became a day longer. Um, I'm going to talk about your work, why you work for um, part of your Sunday as well, so I hope you are ready. Um, I'm excited. I'm not hoping to discourage you. Um, it's a heavy task. I would love to say everything about work today and the challenges you have at work and the good of work, um, but we'll have to stick to the big themes. Uh, and Therefore, we need God to help us extensively as we are together. So let us pray and ask God to help and guide us. Our Father in heaven, it's so liberating to know that you are holy, so liberating to know that you've created us in your image. Lord, it is so liberating to know that you are Lord. Um, Jesus, you are reigning over the cosmos, everything you created, um, as well as us, Lord. The breath we breathe is a privilege you've given us. You've, you've blessed that to be so, Lord. Um, Lord, we pray for specific grace as we talk about work, the time we'll spend for most of our lives, either seeking for work or working, Lord, or worrying about work. 
Um, we need a special grace, Lord. Um, the evil one has discouraged us so many times with how we want to make sense of our work and maybe hurts and challenges we have at work, Lord. So we pray that your spirit and your word will guide us this morning, will give us a fresh perspective, will confirm to us the truths we already know about our work, and help us to understand how you are walking with us through our work um, to glorify you. Um, I pray for those of us who are still considering the faith, that you'll also give us light um, and perspective, how your word, your gospel, your creation is the ultimate way to live for um, as you called us to be. We pray that in your name. Amen. All right, so one of the hardest realities that hits you um, during your adulting phase, all right, this is as you are growing up, you maybe have studied, and you get into adult life, is that you realize you're going to be working for the rest of your life, all right, whether you like it or not, um, you'll need to find a job so that you can provide not just for yourself, but maybe one day for a family. Um, if you don't work, you won't eat. But it was interesting to hear all the sayings we've heard as we've grown up. My dad said to me, if you're not going to work when you're young, you'll work until you die. <laughs> There's always these quite serious sayings that we hear in our context, in our culture, that really forces us to work, to work hard, um, to work as good as we can, um, so that we can provide for our families. Some of the hard realities of work um, is that an adult will spend more or less 50% of his or her life working from Monday to Friday. All right? So Monday to Fridays would be mostly spent working. All right? If you add travel time to work, um, that would probably move something closer to like 60% because you'll be commuting to work, commuting from work. If it's load shedding during work, it would even get more. It's probably 70%. Um, but it, it takes a lot of time to get to your work and it adds up to your life. If you add another 30% in that Monday to Friday, you more or less have 10% of your week left to do what you want to do. All right? That roughly translates to two, three hours a day. All right? I hope you're not too depressed already. Um, then if you add the work stress you bring home, um, it gets much closer to 100% of our time thinking of the work than we want to admit. All right? Work is such a constant part of who we are and what we do. Um, in total, if we get 80 years old, if we live that long, we, work would have ended up being roughly 30% of what you would have spent your time on in your life. And if you spend another 30% sleeping, more or less, it means that you would only have 30% of your life doing anything else but work and sleep. <laughs> right? That's quite hard realities to settle in. For modern day people like ourselves, um, especially for those of us who would be Christians, talking about work is quite a minefield. It's not a topic we like to venture into especially not over weekends, especially not at church. Of course, it's difficult, isn't it? Talking about work is easy on the high level, but when it gets to the intricacies of challenges at work, complexities at work, complexities with our country, complexities with the world, I mean, just think about COVID, how it disjointed everything we knew about work, how we, our companies, our employers are trying to get us back into office space. I mean, it's just chaos. The workplace is a minefield. And then bringing your faith as a Christian into the workplace is also something that is quite challenging. If our multinationals, our global corporations or bigger corporates can have it their, their way, and they already advocate for this, is that please leave your faith at home and come and work and do your work according to the policies we have. It's just safer that way. Especially in a country like ours, the Rainbow Nation, many different cultures and religions trying to work together. It's a nightmare if every one of us would stand on our um, end and start fighting about what's the right way to do our work. So this has a big knock-on effect in how we work and how we think of our work. And unfortunately, the reality we see in our lives is that we actually keep our faith and work separate, especially as Christians. We end up in this discouraged place where we actually don't talk enough about why we work. We kind of stick to the main ideas of, Work, you'll need to do, just do it, all right? Basic stoic line of just push on, push forward. Work, you'll need to do that to provide for your family. 
We have sayings like, I work in a salt mine. <laughs> we have sayings like, it's Monday blues. I have to go to the work in order to provide and pay my bills. I work for the bank. <laughs> Not that I work at the bank, but I work to pay my loan that I have with the bank so that I can go on. All right, you soon become a slave of your work. Um, there's obviously many angles we can talk about what makes it so difficult. Sin is the biggest one. Um, we're going to look at that in some detail, but the world we work in is broken. We as individuals are broken. Our workplace is broken, the people you work for. Um, that obviously has devastating effects in the workplace. Um, then, if that's not enough, there's a devil that's actively trying to discourage you and bite out all this brokenness. And then there's also historic dualism. So this is a big philosoph uh, philosophical term. Um, saying that there's actually two tracks that we live in, all right, two silos that we work in. So it's this sacred and secular divide. So when you work full-time for the church, you are holy, you go to a monastery, you actually worship God there, that's the real holy work of God, and then there is secular work that the rest of the people do, all right, the less holy, the less spiritual work. That is something that we inherited in culture, whether we like it or not. There's the more holy work in being dedicated to God, working full-time for Him, and then the less spiritual work that the rest of us do that kind of makes the world move around. Right, then cultural Christianity kind of played into that in a way in saying that there is the full-time minister, and then there's the part-time minister, and then there's just the member in the church. All right, it goes from holiness to less holy. All right, those feeling called and those feeling less called. All right, you guys are laughing because you know it's true. All right, <laughs> cultural Christianity has not actually done us a favor with dealing with our workplace. I think luckily it's changing in the world we're moving into that's becoming more open, but that's something we've inherited in Christianity. And then, as I mentioned, workplace dynamics. Workplace don't like us to talk about faith. So, there's a quote that I've um, read from Nancy Piercy. I would love to put it up. She talks about the faith gap. Um, she's one of the um, writers on Christianity and faith that I've really found extremely helpful. Um, she worked for quite a while under Francis Schaeffer. Some of you might know him from Labrie. He's done some great work. And she went back to the U.S. as she was helping Christians to get used to working as Christians in the workplace with a Christian worldview. Great book to read, Total Truth is that name, but I got this quote from her. Um, it's very small, but I'm going to read it for us very quickly. She says the following about American Christianity, and I think it's quite true for us as South Africa, calling ourselves a Christian nation as well. She says, Polls consistently show that a large percentage of Americans claim to believe in God or be born again. Yet, the effect of Christian principles is decreasing in public life. Why? Because most evangelicals, biblical believing Christians, have little training or discipleship in how to frame Christian worldview principles in a language applicable to the public square, your workplace. We don't have the necessary tools to do that. Though Christianity is thriving in modern culture, it is at the expense of being ever more relegated to the private sphere. All right, so Christianity is flourishing, but it's being moved out of the public sphere of work into the private sphere of what you do outside of the workplace, outside of work hours. Another way to phrase it is that the private sphere at home has become increasingly religious while at the same time, the public sphere at work has become increasingly secular. Can I see what she's arguing for? In a 1994 poll, 65% of Americans said religion is losing its influence in public life at work, yet almost at the same number, 62%, said the influence of religion was actually increasing in their personal lives. All right, so you're following the logic. Christianity was losing its influence in the public space, but was increasing in its influence in the private space. How I raise my kids, how I love my wife, how I love my husband, um, how I care for the poor. Things outside the workplace. Um, this means that the divide between the public and the private realms has widened to a yawning chasm making it harder than ever for Christians to cross over 
in order to bring biblically based principles into the public arena. Right, I hope you see the big challenge in what she's saying here. Is that we have a big problem if Christianity becomes relegated only to the private sphere of our lives. There's a few reasons, obviously. The one is that is the sphere of life that has the least influence on the bearing of life as well. If you're going to spend 60% or 30% of your life at work, 30% of your Monday to Friday at work, or 60% if you add in the extra traveling to work, for 60% of your life, you're not actually going to know what to do. The other 30% you'll have a good idea, but for the rest, you'd actually be fiddling around. You will try and be trying to live in a world that's not actually reconciled to your belief system. And I want to convince us this morning that God never intended for it to be like that. We as Christians should have a worldview, lenses, glasses that we look at in the world that helps us to make sense of everything, the entire cosmos, even work. And I want us to do that um, for the rest of our time. Um, it's an impossible task, as I said, and I'm going to try and keep to the big storyline of the Christian worldview. But I hope it would give us a framework to keep on conversing around faith and our work. Something that we will need to work together. It won't be from the pulpit that someone can answer all the challenges you have at work. You'll need to take this framework and wrestle it out with in your workplace. So probably the biggest thing we have at stake here when we talk about faith and work is what Dorothy Sayers said. If religion does not speak to our work lives, then it has nothing to say about what we do with the vast majority of our time. And no wonder people say religion is irrelevant. Christianity will become completely irrelevant if we can't breach the faith gap into the public sphere. Completely irrelevant. People say, oh, it's nice that you go to church. Go to church on Sunday, but please leave the church at Sunday. Don't bring it here to work and make things difficult. So please, I don't want a riot on Monday, because we said we need to go and do that. I'm just saying, let's work it out, all right? Um, we need to be wrestling through these um, challenges, and specifically the faith gap. Um, so, as we consider Christianity and think about this, there's obviously a few agreements we need to make. For us as full-time ministers, there's always a confession we need to make in saying that we're not doing nearly enough to equip our people for full-time work. Pastor Tom Nielsen said after a long <laughs> ministry that he had, a faithful pastor, he said, I've always been preparing my people for the minority part of their lives. I've never helped them to be prepared for the majority of their lives. Now, don't throw us with stones here. We're trying to work on that. But it's acknowledging that it's difficult, and therefore we don't like to talk about that, that we have to deal with this now as well. All right. So, as we come to the Bible story, I believe it's the most compelling way to think about work and our faith. And I want to convince us about that then as we get going this morning. So, there's four chapters to the Bible story. We talk about creation in Genesis 1 and 2, how God intended everything to be. Everything was good and how God created. Then there was a fall from this creation that God made. As we turned our backs on God, chapter 2 starts with this devastating, eerie depression of how we turned our back on God and the result of that in the fall. But then not all hope is lost. We get to the third chapter of redemption. That God was not surprised by our rebellion, turning our backs on Him, but that God always had a plan to redeem His creation back and even better than He initially wanted it to be. And then lastly, a full and a perfect restoration that will happen one day when our Lord returns as the final chapter. Our God will make all things new as we end the Bible. Alright, so you'll be in time for rugby, you might miss lunch. But we're going to get through all four chapters of the Bible, all right? But we're going to do it on a bird's eye view, a thousand foot level. We're going to try and work through our Christian worldview um, this morning. All right, so creation, Genesis 1 and 2. Um, as we've read this morning, um, I want us to quickly spend time there because that's actually the foundation of our Christian worldview where we find it specifically talking about work as well. So as we open our Bibles, we see God working. 
It is striking how it repeats, specifically in the Hebrew language, as petition is actually underlining for us, um, how God worked every day, how He worked in creating the cosmos, the reality that we see. And then how He rest on a seven day, making it holy, and worship what He was creating. It was good, it was perfect, what God created in the first six days. Um, then in Genesis 2, verse 3, oh, he blessed it, it was good. So God's work, God worked, God's work was good, and He blessed a day to rest and think about the work that He has done. But then God created, on the sixth day, the apex of His creation, He created man. And He did not create man from nowhere, He created man from His image. So 126, in His likeness. So that means that God created man to be like God to work. Part and parcel of who we are to be working. 2 verse 15 says, The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and keep it. Striking. God created man in his likeness as God worked to similarly work in the garden to work and keep it. God was so serious about this work that He had done that He made a helper fit for Him. It's crazy that God created a woman not for pleasurable life or for, let's not get into the controversial matters, but it's a helper fit for Him to help man to execute on God's strategy of working the cosmos. That is why God created a woman, a helper fit for Him. So even the wife is called to work alongside the husband as they are called to work in this life. So ladies, you can't cop out of working. God made us to be helpers in that way. All right. Um, so important to note, sin has yet not entered the world. So work was created, marriage was created, that's a different conversation, was created before Genesis 3, the fall. Work was not God's idea to enslave us and punish us this side of eternity. Work was an initial plan by God in His cosmos to be part and parcel of being human. We need to start with this foundation. Otherwise, we'll always have a stoic, pessimistic view towards our work. God worked. His work was good. He created us in His image, man and woman, to work like He worked in this cosmos, and to glorify Him as we work. And that word glorify is striking. So it's not just that you work your 8 to 5, but it's the how and the motivation of how you work that is also important. This work needs to glorify God. And this gets then tricky, because then how does my 8 to 5 glorify God? I'm not going to answer that for you in all detail, but we need to know that's why God is calling us to work in this world, is to glorify Him. So there's so much more attached to work than just saying, I'm earning a living. It's actually primarily for a Christian, adding a touching on the point of worship. And does that not put a big spin on that 50%, 60% of your week? That as you wake up to go to work, drive to work, work, come back from work, stress about work needs to fit in with our worship as believers. That's how God intended it to be. Without this view of work for a Christian as worship, you will actually never be able to enjoy your work. Is that not the reality? If you're always going to think of word as work as something that I just have to do, you'll never be able to connect it to a level of worship. All right? And I'm not saying we should idolize our work and be workaholics. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, trying to connect our work to our faith in a way that our work is worship. All right, and we'll go deeper into that as well. So our standing work as God intended it to be has so much attached to it. Not just is it glorifying God as we physically do the work, it's also a witness to the world in the manner that we do our work, and it shines light in the world as we try and do that work. So if you still don't believe me, think of the great commandment that Jesus gave us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Even work. Colossians 3.23 Whatever you do, even work, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not man. 
We'll cycle back to that as we land the plane today. So from creation we learn that God first work. Um, nothing could be added. It was perfect. Um, and he could rest after that work because there was nothing needed in that work. We've been made in God's image and therefore we commanded to work and recreate in a similar way. We recreate with what he created as well. Work is therefore part of our worship to God. And working unto God is central to understanding work's initial purpose. Working toward God with every area of our lives. But then entered sin, the fall. This had devastating effects on work. Look at Genesis 3 verse 17 to 19. And to Adam, God said, as he was busy um, debriefing the sin they have done and, and the results of that, God says to Adam, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you have been taken, and for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So work this side of eternity isn't without cursed ground, the opposite of blessed ground. The work we work on, the work we go to on Monday, is on some level cursed. In pain you shall eat. It's not going to be plain sailing, finding food to eat. Thorns and thistles, it's going to be everywhere. Not everything is going to be edible for food, and while finding food, it's going to bruise you. It's going to give you pain as you try and find something to eat. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. It's going to be hard to work. It's not going to be easy not going to be plain sailing and if you're not discouraged yet it will only last until you die until you return back to ground it won't change until we change this life for the next so let that sink in what we learn from genesis 3 is this not what we experience so often at work if you open news 24 or what the news is about it's full of this the cursedness of the ground that we all are trying to make a living in the challenges of finding work, load shedding, retrenchments, conflict at work, politics in and out of work, deadlines, overworking, underworking government, tenders, fatal workplace injuries, corruption, traffic, procrastination, unfair dismissals, unemployment, corporate greed and exploitation, fear of losing your work if you have work. Genesis 3 has such a devastating effect on all our lives. This was written thousands of years ago, and today we're still dealing with the same thorns and thistles, pains that we have to deal with every day. Now, for many Christians, as we deal with these realities, the knee-jerk response is with the effects of sin in the workplace is just to relegate our faith back into the private sphere, that's what we do outside of work, and we just do our work because we need to do our work. We stop wrestling with the reality of why has God called me to work in a place that is so broken, that is so in need of redemption. And we just start focusing on our family, our friends, our social lives, our travel plans, things outside of work. We stop to wrestle with the brokenness of our work and reconciling it with God's intended purposes, which leads us to being stoic, and disinterested towards our work. The result of this is devastating because we lose our initial calling, worshiping God through our work because it's too hard and cursed to work out. And I want us to dwell on this reality of work being cursed. Not to discourage you, but to manage your expectations so that you can be better prepared for the cursedness of work and above all else know that that is not how God intended it to be. Is that not a liberating thought? God didn't intend load shedding. God didn't intend for corruption. God didn't intend for all the crazy, hair-raising stories we hear about the workplace. That was not part of God's initial plan. But it is a reality. And we should be aware of that. I'd rather know this now 
than going out with the expectation that I'm just going to run over every obstacle ahead of me. But knowing that there's going to be these challenges gives us a humble attitude towards the workplace. Knowing that it's not going to be perfect. Otherwise, you're always going to be discouraged. I hope this will lead us to a place of actually deep communion with God. And I don't do this enough, so I'm somewhat hypocritical as I say this. But I get to moments where I can really repent with God and say, God, it is devastating what we've caused to the old creation. Adam and Eve was our best representation. They turned their back on you. Look how broken our society is. Look how broken our world is. Please give me perspective and hope in this world. That is part of worshiping God, I think, in a cursed world, is that we can come to God and say, God, help me. God, I'm discouraged. God, I'm overworked. God, I don't have motivation. God, help me to be pushing hard at work with a view of glorifying you in this broken world. All right, but there is hope. Chapter 3, redemption. Even in Genesis 3.15, God already promises the hope of redemption. That someone of Eve's offspring will come to crush Satan's head while he can only bruise your heel. Such a great um, illustration in how this dynamic works. The Genesis 3 effect should never be the overall effect in our lives. We should always know whenever we get discouraged that he's only bruising our heels here. One day he's going to be crushed fully and he won't reign supreme over the workplace realities I'm facing. As our Lord and Savior came to live the perfect life that none of us could live and die the perfect death we couldn't die, He opened for us the path to redemption. Redeeming things as they were intended to be. And this opened a path for humanity to be reconciled with our Creator, our Father, in a more meaningful and significant way than ever before. So through repenting of our sin, our Genesis 3 fallenness, believing in Christ as our Lord and Savior, we can be reconciled to our Father. In essence, coming to faith means being calibrated more closely to the original image God intended for us to be, including our work. Ephesians 2 verse 1 to 10 explains this redemption and its relation to work the best for me. I want us to read that quickly. Um, Thank you, Rudolf. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing, your own works. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Is that not an amazing explanation of the redemptive effect of Christ's life, death, and resurrection? We are His workmanship. It's part of God's work in redeeming His people. For what? For living a life on your terms? No. For these works in verse 10 that He predestined us to do. Good works. Works that glorify Him. You see how the faith of a believer is so deeply connected to the work that the believer does as well. Yes, obviously it means sharing the gospel, ministering to people in need. But it's also connected to our work. The good works God called us to do. The redemption that God accomplished for us through the cross was so powerful that all work a Christian does as a new creation in Christ 
is work unto God. So the idea of redemption was a contextual thing in the time of buying a slave from someone and owning that person fully. Everything that person does belongs to you. And that's what God achieved from us, from buying us from the desires and the passion of our flesh, being under the power and the principalities of this world, and bringing us into a new kingdom under our new Lord and Savior, owning us to work unto Him with everything we do. This good works He calls us to do. Work done in faith is work unto the glory of God. Only a Christian has this privilege. Only when you repent and believe the gospel, you have the privilege to claim every work you do as work unto God. Good works, obviously. The New Testament goes into great extent to explain how profound this reality of a newborn believer is with regards to their work. For the sake of time, I just want us to camp out at Colossians 3, 23 to 24. Paul says to the church in Colossae the following, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Amazing passage of Scripture. Paul says work heartily. Why? Because you, Christian, work ultimately for the Lord and not men. You're not working for discovery. You're not working for the bank. You're not working for your company. You are working for the Lord ultimately. That is the privilege a Christian has this side of eternity. You are working for God. Now the context here makes your worst work experience look like a vacation. There were slaves that Paul was writing this to. People who were owned by other people. Probably the most oppressive, unjust, unequal society that ever existed. Paul says these controversial words. Do not work unto men, but work unto God. That's how powerful the gospel is that you are believing God is the ultimate source of authority. Even if you work under the most draconic boss in the world, all right? Imagine that picture. God is still Lord over that situation. And your work that you do is still needing to glorify God as you do that. There's obviously wisdom in these moments. When you work in a very unhealthy work environment, you need to find other work. But in the meanwhile you know you're doing an act of worship if you're doing that work in faith. You know as you're going to work in that difficult situation, your heavenly Father is being glorified as you work, and your work is more important for Him than it is for you. And I think that liberates me in the difficult times at work, to know that God will provide ways for me to work in other contexts if He calls me to work in other place. You follow my reasoning? is that when we get stuck, and I know probably as we talk about work this morning, many of us find us in a difficult T-junction. We might not even enjoy our work for a moment. Don't stop crying out to God. Ask God for fresh perspective in the situation you are finding yourself in. Ask a Christian brother or sister to pray with you and keep you accountable that you look for other opportunities if you are not content at the current work situation. Or if it's just very unhealthy. And now, so many of us have had these experiences. I wonder if none of us ever had an unenjoyable work experience. See God. Your work means much more to Him than it means to you. And it's integral to your worship unto our Lord as well. And then, obviously, there is the hope of restoration. This might be new news to you, but heaven is going to be on earth. Okay, Belinda Carlisle was... Correct, all right? A few old people catch that, not really. Um, God is coming back to earth to make all things new. It is striking as you end with the Bible in Revelation 21. Creating the new heavens and the new earth to make His dwelling place with all whom He redeemed. It will not be an improved garden, but an impressive city shining with the radiance of God's glory for light. There will be no more of the effects of sin and the fall, no more death, mourning, and pain. 
Listen to John's revelation, Revelation 21, verse 1 to 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, not man with God, but God with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And He who has seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And He said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Amazing words that the Bible end on. That God is going to live with man coming to create heaven on earth. Not flushing everything away with a massive Armageddon, but renewing everything that He initially created in the first chapter. Making it better, improving the garden to a city. Not that garden is bad, but making it bigger, more impressive, where all His people will live under His rule and His reign. He will be the light in that new city. And the amazing thing is He sees the tears we cry this side of eternity. He sees the thorns and thistles we feel and experience every day. He does not miss one moment of His children's pain as they're trying to work unto Him. He sees it. He felt it when He walked this earth. Isn't it amazing that our Lord was working as a carpenter for the majority of His life on this earth? His ministry was only three years of His life. For the rest of it, he was working as an everyday person in modern-day Palestine. God knows the thorns and the thistles of this broken world. He knows what every one of us is experiencing, and he's not leaving it there. He is in the process of renewing that, slowly but surely, but eventually, finally, as he comes to restore the new heavens and the new earth. Restoration places immense value on the work we do this side of eternity. If you've not been convinced yet, this must definitely convince you that what you're going to do tomorrow will echo into eternity if you are a believer. Now, there's obviously ways that we can over-spiritualize our work, but there's a way that if we can make living this side of eternity more effective, more just, more blessed, that God will be glorified and that that will echo into eternity. We know what happens in the countries around us where anarchy happens, where there are wars, where things go completely wrong. There's significant destruction. We know how well it goes with countries where there are peace and people get to live together and they get to bless each other through their work. There's great flourishing. So therefore our work is so important because we know as Christians what is coming for us. God is going to come and dwell with us this side of the cosmos in His world. He's coming back here. He's not going to flush it down the rain, drain, but He's going to come and renew whatever we've done. The places we drive to work, the places where we go to work, the places where we get discouraged about our work. He's going to change all the bureaucracy. He's going to change all the difficult things and renew it to a renewed sense as He has initially created the universe to be. That should give us great hope as we think about our faith and work. C.S. Lewis said the following, If you read history, you will find that the Christian who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world, the new world, that they have become so ineffective, ineffective in this world. Is that not... True. 
If we are just battling with the Genesis 3 effects of this world and the challenges at work, and not reminding ourselves that God is coming to renew everything, that we won't get discouraged with our work, that we would go to work with a different attitude, because I know what I'm doing here is having an eternal impact. I'm working unto the Lord. So I want us to conclude. You'll spend most of your life working, whether you like it or not. God worked, and His work was good. God calls us to work as His image bearers, as an act of worship. The fall affected every area of our work. But God sent His Son to provide salvation and redemption for our sin and the effects of the sin in our world so that the Christian can work unto God even when your boss is making your life hell. Our work will echo into eternity as we do our good work in faith to glorify God because He will come and make all things new. Church, it is impossible to live this life with any joy without a biblical understanding of work. Work is such a big part of our lives and intended to be worship unto God. Christians has the privilege to work unto God as your ultimate boss, your Lord, with work that will echo forever. Our boss is seated at the most powerful position in the universe. One day he will wipe away every tear that our work has caused us, but until then we call to seek his face in our workplace, prayerfully asking him for guidance through his spirit to know where and how to work unto him. Seeking God to guide us to bridge this faith gap that every one of us battles in this world. Do not be slow to run to Him. He is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Having worked Himself on this earth, trust in Him and let His Word and His Spirit guide you through His church and fellowship. If we work in such a manner, we will be salt and light to this world in a way that people won't understand. We will know ultimately why we work. We will know why things go wrong at the workplace and for who we work ultimately and know what we do even in a broken world has eternal, that has eternal impact. If we work with this attitude, we will be a salt in a light that people can't miss. May God make us workers like that. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us the story of your word that started with a creation that was good, that was affected in devastating manners by the fall, in ways that we see around us every day in our own lives, in our communities, and in the world we live in. But you brought hope, Lord. You promised for us a Redeemer that came and lived and died and provided for us a way into redemption ourselves, creating in us a new bornness, a new image, to work in a manner that is unto you. Lord, you give us the hope of eternity, not somewhere far away, but right here on earth. Lord, and for many of us, just saying you on earth, it's not something romantic, something to look forward to because of the effects of Genesis 3. But may your spirit and your word create in us a deeper and a more technical view of eternity, of the new heavens and the new earth. Lord, I pray for, pray for those of us who are seeking work, who are unemployed in a country with over 30% unemployment. Lord, help us find work because you call us to work. Lord, for those of, our, of us who are working, help us to find our joy in our work. Not in an ultimate sense of just working, but working unto you. Help us where we overwork and where there's expectations upon us that is detrimental to our family life, our marriages, and our friendships. Lord, help us to be salt and light at work. Lord, we pray for special wisdom in those difficult situations at work where we can influence the public sphere, where we need to make difficult decisions that will have eternal impact in our communities. Lord, please give us confidence, give us wisdom, give us humility, Lord, to deal in this broken world that will be salt and light unto your glory. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Music